Welcome to Under the Microscope. This series is brought to you by the Real Scientists Nano team. Our goal is to provide a platform where scientists can communicate their work and interact with the public. With that in mind, every week we introduce you to a scientist working in the field of materials and nanoscience, who would be curating the Real Sci Under Scroll Nano Twitter account. everyone, today we have with us Anna Porchewski, who is a material scientist, a science writer, and a storyteller. Hi Anna, how are you doing? Hello, I'm very well, thank you. It's great to see you, great to be here. We are, we are delighted to have you. Um, and I'm so excited to learn about you and your research and your work, what you do right now, and some interesting book that is coming out. So let me start, uh, space it out a little bit. Let me start with um, asking you about your career journey so far. So how did you end up in becoming a, a science writer or, and a storyteller and also writing a book now? So tell us about your career. Sure, no problem. So to give people a bit of an idea, I'm 29 years old as we speak now, uh, 30 in a few months, kind of scary. Um, so we're talking about a, a approximately a decade long um, material science career. And the story starts actually when I was at school and thinking of applying to university, I applied for physics because I knew that I liked science. I really enjoyed maths um, and I'd never really, well, I certainly hadn't heard of material science. I hadn't really even thought of engineering as a, as a career choice. Um, mm -hmm. So I studied maths, further maths, physics and music um, at the end of school, applied mm -hmm. for physics um, and I applied to Oxford for physics because, you know, I wanted to aim for the stars, go for <laughs> go for the top. Um, and mm -hmm. I, I was lucky enough to be offered an interview there. And a few weeks before the interview, they wrote to all the physics applicants to ask if they wanted to apply for material science as well. Because um, I think the material science department were very low that year on applicants because it is a subject that not many people have heard of. Um, and I think they were low on applications. And so I just said, sure, because, you know, it was an extra sort of free shot, um, shot at the goal, as mm -hmm. it were. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I said yes. And, and I went to um to go to these interviews and you have to stay at oxford for like three nights um and go around all these interviews it's super intense and weird um and for the okay. first three days i was doing these physics interviews and something just wasn't really clicking you know i'd meet these mm -hmm. professors firstly it was obviously a terrifying experience i'd never met a professor before and so i'd have mm -hmm. these conversations with these professors and they'd say you know why do you want to study physics and i'd sort of mumble something about you know wanting to learn about how the universe works and Mm. liking string theory or something I don't know <laughs> um but th there was something we just weren't really vibing you know and then mm. um on the final morning that I was there I had this material science interview and I sat down with these really open and not intimidating professors who they, they knew that I hadn't applied for the subject so they were sort of saying you know what are you interested in let's have a chat about this lump of steel on the desk um, how do you think it broke? What do you think it might have used? You know, what component might it have been? All this mm. sort of stuff. And it was much more of a two way dialogue and a really nice conversation. Anyway, mm -hmm. I sort of went away from those interviews thinking like, oh, I don't think I really did my best in the physics ones, but the materials one was fun. And then a few weeks mm -hmm. later, I got this letter through my door and I was offered the chance to study material science. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. I'm so thankful to be given this opportunity but also what is material science? I've got no <laughs> idea. <laughs> so I sort of went, went to undergrad thinking like, I don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> what is this? What's going on? But it turned out that actually, in, for, for my case anyway, material science was a really lucky, that was a really lucky kind of event that happened because for me, it's a lot more applied than a subject like physics. Um, it still has a lot of physics in there, you know, the quantum mechanics of glass and lots of um, sort of like weird quantum stuff about semiconductors and how they work in computers and things. So a lot of physics is in there, but also there's a lot of real life hands on engineering stuff. Like I remember in our undergraduate um, labs, we would have to like take apart. I think we took apart a lawnmower and had to work out what all of the 
components were made out of and why they were made mm-hmm. out of those materials. And I just found it yeah. fascinating that the science that, and maths that I'd been learning at school could finally actually be applied to stuff. So mm-hmm. I really enjoyed my undergraduate and that was sort of the, the start of the journey. But as I was going through it, I wasn't, I wasn't convinced that I wanted to be a material scientist for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. You know, I sort of just viewed it as a means to an end in a way, but then I wasn't really sure what the end was. And then in my fourth year, the, the undergraduate degrees in Oxford, the fourth year is a master's year. So it's all kind of integrated together. Um, so it's just a full year of master's research. And I was really interested in um, sort of green energy and sustainability. And one of the projects that was available was to do with hydrogen storage materials. And it was mm-hmm. based actually not at the university, but um, in industry, which I thought was quite interesting as well. So mm-hmm. I, I, I opted to take that, um, that master's project and I ended up working for this little spin out company um, called Seller Energy. And they were looking mm-hmm. at hydrogen storage materials, which is essentially a way to store hydrogen, which as we know is normally a gas, um, in mm-hmm. a solid form in order to be able to power things like drones and maybe one day cars, portable devices like laptops, that kind of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. And it was an amazing year because I was working in a team with probably only about five or six other research scientists, but they were all sort of senior postdoc level and above. They certainly all had a PhD at least and also loads of research experience. And then there was little old me, <laughs> master's student, <laughs> never really done any research before. A bit kind of bookish, like, you know, I knew all the <laughs> theories and stuff, but I didn't really know no. what I was doing in a lab. Um, mm. And so, but, but, despite that you know my my team there really treated me as a valued member of the team and Mm -hmm. and listened to my ideas encouraged my experiments um which really grew my confidence in research and so by the end of that year I was kind of looking around and I was thinking actually this is really cool I think I do want to be a material scientist right but then I looked at all of them and I was like oh they've all got PhDs I guess I need a PhD now. Yeah, I guess that's the (laughs) next thing, isn't it? So that I can go and do this. So the company ended up sponsoring me through the PhD um, through a a centre for doctoral training at UCL in London. So then I moved to London um, and started that. And it was pretty tough, to be honest with you. Lots of reasons, really. Firstly, PhDs are pretty tough anyway. Um, Mm -hmm. But I was working still with that company, but now sort of remotely from academia, so there was a mm-hmm. cultural difference there in terms of industry work versus academia. Um, there was much more independent research now because I wasn't surrounded by my team of helpful, lovely scientists. Um, <laughs> so all that sort of stuff, plus the usual PhD baggage, which is like, what am I doing? <laughs> Please, mm. somebody help me. Um, so so yeah. it was really tough. And, and to kind of, to get, out of the lab and sort of make new friends and get a bit more involved in the university life I decided to take an optional sorry an optional course in public engagement um Mm -hmm. I can't really tell you why I found the idea of communicating science to the public interesting but there was something in it that I thought I suppose because I was you know on my own in my lab quite insular I really wanted to get out there into the world and like talk to other people And so Mm. I took this course and as I said earlier, I'm a bit bookish. I'm definitely a bit of a teacher's pet. (laughs) And so (laughs) like during this course, I was being very, I was contributing a lot. You know, if, if the person that was leading the course asked a question, I'd always put my hand up. That's just the kind of nerd that I am. (laughs) And so I was contributing a lot to the class, but I'm, but I absolutely not a natural extrovert at all. Um, I'm quite an introverted person kind of in my everyday life but anyway at the end of this course the the person running it said you seem like like a bit of a show-off do you want to come and do some stand-up comedy about your research and again because I'm a teacher's pet I said yeah sure (laughs) (laughs) I really want to please you (laughs) (laughs) so I said yes but then afterwards I was like oh no I hate public speaking I'm an introvert (laughs) I don't want to do this but Anyway, then I, I ended up having to do it because I wanted to, you know, please this authority figure. And um, so I did a nine minute stand up comedy set in a comedy club about hydrogen storage materials. Um, and it was terrifying, but really also very enjoyable. And 
I learned a lot about myself through doing it. I learned a lot about science communication and something about it really intrigued me. I think because stand up is quite kind of elusive. You, it's never really clear why one joke lands and the other one doesn't. It's mm-hmm. it's there is no right and wrong. You can't get 100 percent in the exam. <laughs> and so it, it, I, I didn't quite understand it. And I found that really intriguing. And so I kept doing more and more stand up comedy and communicating mm-hmm. my science to the public. And then mm-hmm. having having done that for a few years, you know, people started asking me questions about material science because I was now sort of the, the person that people would ask. And they'd ask stuff like, you know, why does my phone screen always smash? Well, it's because it's made of glass. Well, why is it made of glass mm-hmm. if it always smashes? Wouldn't it be better to made of plastic? And I sort of thought, yeah, mm-hmm. actually, that's a good point. I don't know why it's made out of glass. And, and people would, they would start asking me questions that I couldn't answer even though I was supposed to be the expert in materials, right? So this question sort of bugged me for quite a while, you know, why can't I answer these, these real life questions um, Mm -hmm. that my, that my friends and audiences are asking me. And one day I, I actually broke something in my lab um, in my, one of my experiments. And I was told to go to a department called the Institute of Making to get it fixed. Mm -hmm. And this was a, a new department at UCL based it was set up as a workshop um, and mm-hmm. a place for people to be able to go and experiment with materials in a hands-on way. And mm-hmm. so I went there, I was sort of clutching my piece of copper pipe that I needed to solder back together. And in this place, I realised that the answer to, you know, why do phone screens always crack? Well, it's not actually that much to do with science. It's more to do with who we are as humans and what we want out of our objects. You know, mm-hmm. a, a glass phone screen makes us makes the object appear more kind of high value. It makes us feel like Mm -hmm. a more high value person if we own objects like that. Um, And I came to realize that, you know, material science has got a really human side to it. And that was a Mm -hmm. side that I didn't understand at all. But there was Mm -hmm. all to do with making and design and craft um, and art as well. um, And all this stuff that as a scientist, I had no idea about. And so Mm -hmm. for the last couple of years, I've been... I've been interested in this intersection between craft and making and materials. Um, and so that is what the book is about, basically the last few years of my explorations and that. Um, so mm-hmm. I've interviewed over 60 makers and crafts people for my podcast, which is also called Handmade. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, yeah, it, that, that's what I'm doing at the moment is, is exploring this intersection. Um, mm-hmm. Meanwhile, I did a postdoc at UCL to continue that, the, the journey, um, of of the um of the making side and then that all finished in July this year um Mm -hmm. because it was just a two-year postdoc and they were like right you're done that's it time up time's up um (laughs) and so so my plan was to be a freelance science communicator obviously in 2020 that hasn't been hugely um as attractive an option as it might have been um with lots Mm -hmm. of events cancelled and stuff so now I'm working in-house at Imperial College as a science writer, um, writing bits and bobs for them and also sort of training researchers in the art of storytelling and science communication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, wow, that's quite a journey you've had. And it's it's really interesting what you said that the material science has a human side to it. I I had, this is a brand new perspective for me because I hadn't thought about it. You are absolutely right. Most of the things we do as a, as material scientists, uh, there's a human side to it. We have to factor that uh, human element in uh, whenever we are deciding which material to use, how to process it, how it should look like at the end, or uh, how it should feel like, how it should work. There is a human side to it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's it's so fascinating though your journey. It's it's so cool. So you you did mention what you're doing right now, but where do you fit in the in the big uh, materials and nanoscience world? Where do you see yourself fitting if you are not an active researcher? Where do you fit? So I identify as a sort of materials generalist now. Um, obviously, I did my PhD research. I am the world expert in that super super niche tiny thing. But but <laughs> oh, now I'm I'm so much more interested in in all materials you know stone just as valuable as graphene as nanomaterials as wool you know Mm. that all these materials that we don't necessarily think of as scientists as materials of interest actually i think there's a lot of value in 
you know, looking at the whole spectrum of materials on an equal footing. Um, mm-hmm. And so, so p- partly a materials generalist, but I also identify as a storyteller because that kind of encompasses all of the science communication work that I've been doing, the stand up, the writing is all about, you know, telling stories. And it is about tapping into that human side of science, um, mm-hmm. either through telling the story of what it's like to be a scientist or, you know, the story of an invention in history, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, it's about painting, I think, a really colourful picture of science and, and not just focusing on the nitty gritty details of the theories and the graphs. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. OK, OK, yeah, that makes sense. Materials g- generalist? Yes. Uh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> OK, materials generalist, storyteller, science writer. Oh, uh, so many, so many hats you're wearing. It's 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 <laughs> it's so cool. So, um, could you could you tell us about when you were an active researcher, or, or even after that, like since uh, from your parallel science communicator journey as well, um, an experience or a research project or anything that you're like, oh, I'm really proud of this, or this was really fun, or this was really uh intense but fun and quirky uh or let's go with the most proud of so could you pick one research project or ex- uh, experience from your journey so far and explain it to us in in super simple words yeah sure so the one that springs to mind is actually within my within my phd research it was the mm-hmm. the one moment where i felt like i had a proper eureka oh my God, I'm a scientist moment. This is what it is. This is the thing. Um, As I said, 10 years of being a scientist has been one of those moments for me. Um, (laughs) And it was all to do with, um, so as I said, I was researching hydrogen storage materials um, and the compound that contains hydrogen um, is called, the one that I was working with is called ammonia borane, um, Mm -hmm. which for for chemical formula fans is NH3 BH3. So it's got loads and loads of hydrogens in it. It's very lightweight. Mm-hmm. Um, when you when you get it in the lab, it's sort of like quite a spiky white powder. Um, mm-hmm. And this material is very naturally high in hydrogen and that hydrogen is released, it decomposes um, and the hydrogen is released when you heat it up. <clears throat> Excuse mm-hmm. me. When you heat it up to around 120 degrees Celsius. Mm-hmm. And so that that's great because you can incorporate that into um into some sort of device it, it's never actually been built before that, well it hasn't until we've worked on it um you know a way of heating up these little pellets of this material to be able to release hydrogen and then you can use that to power a hydrogen fuel cell which is um sort of like a battery similar to a battery with electrodes and things like that but it takes in hydrogen mm-hmm and it takes in oxygen from the air and it combines those together to make water and in doing so it creates electricity. So it's basically a way of making electricity from hydrogen in quite a clean energy system. Mm -hmm. The problem with this material is that although it releases hydrogen at about 120 degrees Celsius, it actually melts at about 114 degrees Celsius. So just before it releases hydrogen, it melts. So what you end up doing is heating up this solid and then it becomes a liquid and then it releases gas. So it becomes this huge foamy mess. <laughs> um, it bubbles everywhere. It's horrible to clean up. Um, it's really not practical for using in, you know, like a, a, a practical device. And so mm-hmm. my task, well, actually, before I joined, what the company had done was they had combined this hydrogen storage material with a polymer, with a plastic into a composite And that plastic Mm -hmm. basically helped to sort of hold everything together to stop the ammonia borane from melting so that now when you have a pellet of it and you heat it up, it stays as a pellet, but the hydrogen can still come out. So Mm -hmm. when I first joined the company, that was that was where they were at. They were like, we've got this material. We've managed to do this. Uh, We know it works, but we actually don't Mm -hmm. know quite how it works. So can you go away and tell us? So that was my remit Uh was how does this material work? And so I took a sort of very classic material science approach, which was, okay, well, this is a composite. And I know from my lectures that composites, you know, it's generally two or more different materials combined together in some way, um, in some Mm -hmm. certain ratio to produce a new material. So I varied Mm -hmm. the ratios between the two materials. I I made a phase diagram. We love phase diagrams as material scientists. (laughs) A temperature composition phase diagram. It was beautiful. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> but but that still didn't tell us. Well, so so in, so, have we got time to go into some real science? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so the experiments Absolutely. the experiments that I was doing was um, something called differential scanning scanning calorimetry, which is basically you put the material in a little pot, you heat it up, and you watch you watch how much heat comes out of it as you're heating it up because um, physical phenomena like melting, for example, is something that actually um, absorbs heat from from the from the sort of atmosphere. Surroundings. Yeah. So mm-hmm. so but, so when you heat this thing up, you can draw a graph and you can see a little kind of dip in your in your sort of line that you've drawn. Um, and so you know, mm-hmm. oh, at that temperature, this material is melting. So I had all these beautiful graphs. Um, I knew all of the different melting temperatures, but at one of the compositions. Um, of this composite, so I think it was like 30% ammonia borane and 70% polymer, there was a mystery mm-hmm. dip and we didn't know what it was from. So mm-hmm. something was going on in that material. There was some sort of melting happening um, at that composition, but only at that special composition. And we were like, oh, that's really mm-hmm. weird. Like, what is going on with this mystery dip? And so mm-hmm. I sort of went away and I was looking at the structure of the materials and how they combine at the very kind of smallest levels and one day Mm -hmm. I sat down on my computer and I just sort of googled like I don't even know what I googled it's basically like what happens if if two molecules make up one crystal or if two molecules make up one material and I came up the answer pinged up on my laptop which was that this is a co-crystal this is a supra molecular crystal. And I was like, what? This is everything. And all of a sudden I saw the same graphs that I had been making in the lab. I suddenly saw them pinging up on Google images with other people that have made other co-crystals. And I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like now I've got all the answers. Um, yeah. And that was amazing. And so that is a new material that I discovered. Um, and it was just the most amazing feeling to suddenly have everything click into place. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, you know, since then we've we've managed to publish. Uh, we did some single crystal X-ray diffraction, which means that we now know exactly where all of the atoms are inside that crystalline structure, and we publish mm-hmm. that structure. And yeah, that is, I think, probably my best piece of science because it was something that I actually discovered. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Your eureka moment. It's it sounds so cool. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's it's really really cool. And to a certain extent, I understand what you mean because I had a similar moment during my PhD oh, work nice. as well. Like, oh my god, I'm the first one to see these. It's oh my so god, amazing. other people have been looking for this, and other people yep. have similar results to a certain extent. It's so cool. It's the best. Uh, it's the it's it's a different kind of a high. It's it's so cool. Yeah, um, it's amazing. <laughs> Uh, so thank you for sharing that and also explaining it in super simple words to us because I understood most of it. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, I can understand why you chose this to be the experiment that you're proud of. Like one of, let's put it that way, one of the proud <laughs> uh, research uh, project, so to say. Um, super. That's and, and, and while you were explaining, I realized that you definitely are a science communicator because you would you would say the, the scientific, the jargon or the term, but then you would also explain it, um, which brings me to my next question, which is, um, do you do you want to train scientists or do you do train scientists already? Like, do you do that? Like as um uh, equivalent to what teaching could be like do you do such such a thing and would you like to talk about it yeah for sure so so the thing that I'm really interested in you've already mentioned it is storytelling is you know how Mm. to bring science alive by telling people stories um Mm. and over the last few years I've read loads of books and watched loads of TED talks on the internet about how to tell a good story and the people that we or that I found to learn from have been you know people that write movies and literature and um tv shows because Mm -hmm. you know that's obviously their that's their raison d'etre you know (laughs) that's that's what they do (laughs) is tell you know gripping drama um yeah and so I've always found it a really interesting hypothesis really what happens if you try and bring drama to science or you know bring storytelling to science um Mm -hmm. and it's something that I experimented with a little bit in writing my PhD thesis um is Mm -hmm. it this might sound silly but you know in my um in my literature review trying to find the drama of you know what was going on back then who were the key players 
were they in rival laboratories um you know did they publish on in the same you know edit sorry did they publish in the same um issue of the journal who who mm -hmm. published something that actually discounted there's loads of drama to be to be found in science and so i really enjoyed yeah. picking that stuff out and then mm -hmm. Then through the last few years, obviously writing the book, um, I really wanted to to practice this storytelling. And through the success of, of, of writing that and then also the thesis, I've I've sort of developed this this training. Um, it's not so much a course, but it's sort of like, yeah, it's sort of training manual, really, for, for researchers and scientists and academics to be able to start practicing storytelling techniques in the normal stuff that we have to write, our master's theses, our papers, because we actually already do write stories as scientists, you know, like a mm -hmm. normal, a normal structuring of a scientific paper is introduction, methods, results, conclusion, right? Well, that's mm -hmm. kind of the same as an archetypal story. You've got introduction, which is your you know, where the story starts. And then you've got a hypothesis, a question, what happened? The middle mm -hmm. part is your journey that you go on. That's the, the methodology and the results. And then the end is the conclusion and the resolution. So the right. stuff that we, that, we, that we write about science is already kind of in a storytelling structure, but I'm really interested in going further with that and digging deeper and saying, you know, can we use characterization theories from screenwriting to write our PhD thesis and make it more interesting for the um, for the for the people reading it, um, for the people mm -hmm. doing our vivas and stuff, um, mm -hmm. and the answer is yeah, I think we can. So now I'm I'm training <laughs> um, training researchers at Imperial at the moment um, and hoping to kind of roll it out further because uh, I really uh -huh. do think that you know just because we're scientists it doesn't mean we don't want to be entertained, right? Just because Absolutely. we're examining someone's viva it doesn't mean you know, they've got, <laughs> this is what I thought when I was writing my thesis, I was like, oh God, these people, poor people have got to read 200 pages of my stuff. Like, the least <laughs> I can do is making it a bit kind of fun and interesting and entertaining for them. So that's, right. that's, you know, where I went with it. And I think it's the same with presentations, you know, we've all sat through mm -hmm. the most boring conference presentations ever. And the science is yes. great, but the, the delivery is just not there. And so right. I think there's there's very, very easy things we can do um, as scientists to, to tell better stories to each other. So that's mm -hmm. my campaign mm -hmm. is to make scientists better <laughs> storytellers. <laughs> that, that sounds so cool. And you're absolutely right. We are telling a story to a certain extent, whichever version, like however we are doing it. Right now it might seem flat, but there is always a way to spice it up. Exactly. A little and, and, and make it more fun and interesting. Yeah. Uh, just to have... Uh, just have fun with it. Yeah. Science is fun. Um, totally. Have you, ever, <laughs> have you ever been at a conference where someone has done a talk and then they've cracked a joke and the whole, it's not even a very good joke, but the whole room like falls about laughing and thinks it's the most hilarious thing ever because it's just like one scrap of like humanity that is coming across. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that th that is a good way to engage your audience as totally. well I mean, why do you why do you defend your thesis for for phd uh, title of course but at conferences why would you why do you give a talk because you want people to listen to your latest results so you need to find ways to make it more engaging for the audiences, especially for these 12 hour days <laughs> conferences 100 <laughs> percent yeah <laughs> yeah yeah that's so cool. That's it's really cool. I'm super excited to read the PhD thesis of this this uh, what storytelling kind or dramatized <laughs> version. I don't know how to call it. It sounds super interesting. Um, all right, and I I hope your research experience has been wonderful, and your your uh, science communication and freelancing experience also has been wonderful. Um, however, if you have to uh, if you had three wishes to improve it. Um, what would you ask for? And I'm not promising anything here. <laughs> what? You're not my fairy godmother. You can't just wave a magic wand. So I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure these are things that we all wish for. Um, the three that I've chosen are, well, the first two are fairly straightforward. You know, I, I would, I would love for academia or or industri industrial research actually to be paid proportionately to sort of other sectors um mm -hmm. you know we do train for so many years to do this job and yet 
the salaries are those of you know a, a kind of a graduate uh, I don't know, let's say an accountant or something. I, I'm not to put accountancy mm. down in the slightest at all. Um, but, you know, I feel mm. like we have to train for so much longer to then just get onto the first rung of the of the salary ladder. And it is quite, it just doesn't make us competitive and we lose brilliant people because, you know, mm -hmm. unfortunately people do have to earn money to live. Um, and not all of us can afford to you know, live for four years on a PhD salary if we haven't got parents, you know, that live in big cities with big universities. There's, if you have mm -hmm. to pay your way, it's really hard. Um, so yeah. there's that one. The other one is short-term contracts. Um, mm -hmm. After you, well, the PhD itself is, is a, is a four-year or three-year contract, but then you've got these postdocs, which are anything between six months and let's say three years of a postdoc contract people mm -hmm. move around the world for these things and it's so unsettling and it's often at a time of life you're in your 20s and 30s it, it's it is a time of life that you can afford to travel but after a certain point it's tiring to do that and you do just want to kind of feel like you've got a bit more sort of you're putting down roots in a way um, mm -hmm. and it's really it's really kind of debilitating to have to keep you know keep applying for jobs and keep getting new contracts um so mm -hmm. I'd love to see the end of short term contracts, please. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and the final one is is zero tolerance to harassment, um, particularly well, my experiences of sexual harassment in higher education. Um, obviously, there's all sorts of, unfortunately, other examples of harassment that happen as well. But in my experience, I, I had quite a negative experience in my PhD of um, a sort of bullying character in the lab who 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 did um, you know, exhibit behaviours of sexual harassment to a lot of the, the other researchers. And I remember at the time, the university had this zero tolerance campaign and they had zero tolerance posters everywhere. But my experience was one that actually the university seemed very tolerant of it. Um, you know, the complaints were put forward and then dropped and then put forward again and dropped again. And there's, there's no safety mechanisms there for for people at all levels of the academic hierarchy um, to feel supported and listened to. To me, zero tolerance means exactly that. It means, you know, if a complaint is made, then it is taken very, very seriously to the to the most to the biggest extent. And if it if the complaint is found to be substantiated, then that person is made to leave. That is zero tolerance. Whereas yeah. I don't know a single example of someone that has been you know forced out of their job because of allegations of sexual harassment and and it's just it makes the environment so hostile to in this example um women and people in gender minorities but you know there are so many other minority groups in science as well that are underrepresented um and it, it just makes it you know, not not the most vibrant place and brilliant place to work that it could be. So I would really mm -hmm. love to see, you know, a bigger crackdown in, in all forms of, of harassment. Basically, you walk the talk, don't just say that you have zero tolerance, exactly. but actually exhibit that you have zero tolerance uh, when such a thing happens at your institution or around you. Don't just just walk the talk. Exactly uh, right. Institution. Yeah, exactly mm -hmm. right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wish I wish uh, I could grant all three of your wishes, uh, <laughs> uh, especially the last one because I think that's just no. There is there is. At, come on, we are in 2020. Exactly. How long are we gonna yeah. continue uh, to protect predators of yes. any kind? Uh, how long are we gonna do that? It's just bad for science. I mean, come on. Yeah. If 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 you think about it, like if you want logical reasons, more logical reasons, it's bad for the science. It's bad for the scientific output of your researchers. Uh, look at it that way. If that's totally. what uh, will make you yeah. uh, act on it. Um, yeah, I wish I wish I could do also with the the long term contracts and decent salary. I think I think just at least go with the decent salary for scientists absolutely and yeah we, we are not we are not expecting millions nope. and millions but just decent salary because otherwise you will lose um, lose people because not everyone can afford uh to to do science as like a hobby is <laughs> exactly to a certain extent. totally uh, we can't 
can't really do that. I ho- I wish I could do that. I I wish I could just be like tomorrow when you wake up and everything is going to the world is going to be a better pl- place. All three wishes granted. Um but I would like to believe that we are we are working towards uh um uh, such a future and and young um, scientists like you even if you're not an active scientist you are talking and you, are, you I would still call you a material scientist uh, I'll continue to call you a material scientist um so if you are aware of it I'm sure uh, I'm sure our future is secure and we are in safe hands so to say um and speaking of future what are you most looking forward to in the next 3 months so 2021 is set to be a really exciting year for me. Um as I said I've got my new book coming out called Handmade: A Scientist's Search for Meaning Through Making. And it tells the story of all of the adventures that I've been on throughout my kind of scientific career and then getting to meet these makers, having a go at their crafts, having a go at blacksmithing, um stone masonry, uh knitting, all, all these different crafts and then taking a look at their materials as well. Uh-huh. So that's coming uh-huh. out in on May the 13th in the UK. Um if you've got international mm-hmm. listeners, th- it will be coming out internationally I hope. Um those contracts are are underway um at the moment. So but sometime next year internationally as well, hopefully. Um mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. yeah, I'm really excited to to kind of have that out in the world because I've been writing it for the last couple of years. It was finished during lockdown 2020. Mm-hmm. Um and it's 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 a real labor of love i have to say it's it's sort of part memoir part popular science so there's lots of personal mm-hmm. stories in there um and yeah i'm just really excited and terrified for people to see it <laughs> <laughs> that sounds super exciting looking forward to that book for sure Thank so you. anna this has been wonderful but before i let you go one last question um what do you think from your perspective what are the big challenges faced by this field of materials or nanoscience from your perspective what are the big challenges i think for me the one of the big challenges is kind of a pr problem for science and scientists because you know in the public's mind they have a very strong sense of who a scientist is and who's allowed to do science um mm-hmm. that is absolutely not representative of the scientists that i know let alone the scientists that you know i don't know around the world and so there are brilliant people working in science from all different works walks of life but for some reason there's a disconnect between what goes on in our labs and how the public perceive that so mm-hmm. this is why it's my mission really to to kind of empower scientists with the skills of storytelling so that they can go out and feel able to tell people who they are tell people about their science and let themselves be seen as fully rounded human beings who yeah they're good at science but they might also be really good at the clarinet or you know <laughs> hockey or whatever it is that they enjoy whatever. you know we we are right. we are normal quote on quote nobody's normal really but but we're just like <laughs> anyone else <laughs> we are humans as well <laughs> exactly exactly um so to me that's that's one of the biggest challenges um but mm-hmm. as i say there are brilliant people making a huge difference in that area so hopefully it will only get better absolutely absolutely so thank you very much anna this has been lovely and looking forward to having you on real scientist nano thank you very much for speaking with me thank you so much it's been a pleasure thank you for listening To know more about us, please visit our website realscientistsnano.org and follow us on Twitter at realsci_nano.